Join us for a journey as we go back to the great civilizations of the past. Who were the people? What were they like? How did they begin and how did they end? Let's find out on episode 89, the 680s BC, part 2. Hi guys, welcome back. We're just going to jump right back into the 680s BC, part 2. We're into the Greek world. Oh, tell me more. You have a wonderful podcast or in YouTube show on the coloniz- Greek colonization of the Mediterranean, which is a whole topic of, on its own. But in the 680s, we have a couple of colonies that were founded by uh, Greeks. And the first one here is um, uh, the Greeks from Rhodes and Crete, the Cretans found Gala in Sicily, which is still there today. Yep. And that's, that's there um, from Crete, not Cretans, as far as, you know, as stupid people. Yeah. It's Cretans. So Gala is in the south of Sicily. Uh, it's located on a long and low hill running parallel to the Mediterranean. It's had settlements there already. The first uh, settlements date back to the Copper Age, you know, in the 2800 B.C., the um, leaders of the colonization were Antifemo, he was from Rhodes, and Antimo from Crete. They ri- originally, they called this town Lindoi, Lindoi, and then they changed it to Gala. Probably because everybody was saying Gala. Yeah, probably. Because there was a Lindoi river. is hard to say. Totally hard to say. As you could hear me trying to say, it was pretty bad. <laughs> I don't think I did it correctly either. I, I, it's pretty cool, though. How, I mean, I think it's really, um, you know, how brave to, I mean, these people just get up, leave their homes, right? Get on ships and head over to uh, a whole new place. Yeah, it's uh, episode 55 of this podcast where, where we talk about Greek colonization and the sort of uh, motives behind it and how it worked. Yeah, and every I guess every different place probably had its own reasons, but a lot of it I think was to do with land. They probably needed more land. You know, you had if you had a, if you had a big plot of land, and you had three sons, and you divided that up to them, and then they had three sons, and they divided. Eventually, there wasn't much farmland, so people get up and move away. And we also have the uh, uh, the enormous population growth in Greece. The way the Greeks are doing everything right and Sort of uh, more people are surviving. They have a lot of food. It's so they can do this expansion. They have been doing it for quite some time now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's funny how they think of a population being overcrowded. I mean, just uh, my little town here is probably more crowded than their biggest cities at the time. But they obviously needed more room to farm and have more space, and they're used to having more space around living on top of each other. How many people live in Scranton? Well, in Scranton, the actual city is probably 60,000, which is considered a small city. And the whole area, maybe the whole maybe 40-mile region is maybe 300,000, something like that. I mean, that had been a metropolis back in the day. Uh, We have about uh, 2 million in the, the metropolitan area here in Stockholm. Right. So, I mean, if that was Greece in the day, they'd been getting on ships and heading all over the place. Yeah. They would consider that way overpopulated. But this foundation of Gela was one of the most daring enterprises of Greek colonization in Sicily because it took possession of the island's southern coast. And that was a pretty dangerous place because there were important indigenous Sisanian and Sicily centers. So when the Rhodium Cretans landed, they reduced the local people to a servile state, except perhaps the women, which they took as wives in the first two generations because they had uh, too few women. They occupied the plains and the surrounding hills and merged this indigenous culture with their own, which is I mean, not politically correct either. No, I mean, I guess they didn't bring any women with them, so they figured we'll just get some when we get there. And that's, uh, that's a bit exceptional as well. I think the, the Greeks often did that. But we talked about that in episode 55 as well. Yeah. I do my, one of my favorite movies. Well, I should say my favorite movies. Um, the Princess Bride. And 
never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But um, it worked out for the Greeks because they did overwhelm the uh, indigenous tribes. And that colony is still there. I mean, the city of Gala is still there today. That must be um, a, a good mark for their colonization effort. Yeah, I would say. I did some uh, research on the on the trip a little bit, you know, just distance and things like that. So from Rhodes to Crete, it's 300 kilometers or 186 miles. And from Crete to Gala is about 1,000 miles, 1,700 kilometers. Yeah. Um, they probably would have hugged the shoreline. I actually, when I did a Google Maps and I put, you know, you click the directions how to get there by boat and it showed you the route where they would have gone by, um, you know, hug the shoreline if you took a ferry. Um, I did some calculating. I figured the whole trip being um, at that, oh, so that's like 1,700 miles when you, uh, you know, hug the shoreline. Yeah. So probably took them between 30, 17 and 30 days on the ships to get there. Could they bring is, enough it, supplies for such a long trip or did they have to stop and gather supplies? I would think that they would bring enough supplies. I mean, they could stop at ports on the way. Yeah, they could. They could prepare it, like order supplies from colonies on the way. That's true. That is true. They could pick up. I'm sure there was ports and, and on the way, so they could stop and pick up some things. Seventeen um, days sounds uh, pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, seventeen would be the uh, fastest. And in, oh, so how I got that amount? There was um, there's a record of a pirate ship, for, uh, according to Xenophon. He re references a pirate ship making a 400 miles trip from Rhodes to Ephesus, and that took four days. So that's 100 miles a day. And they said this particular pirate ship was not super fast, um, but still the colonist ships were probably slower. So even if you said like 25, 50 miles a day at the time, you know, the distance we figured. So it comes out to about 17 to 30 days. Oh, well, that's reasonable. Right. Yeah. I mean, 17 is probably fast, so more like 30, 30 days. Mm. I also know I did a little thing of the, the, the Mayflower that came to, the, uh, to, to America in 1620. That took them 66 days to cross the Atlantic. Yeah. So they didn't have any coast to hug. So I would think 30 days is probably a good average time it would have taken them. Yeah, that kind of makes you wonder why it took Odysseus 20 years to get home to Greece from Troy. But he was well, pretty uh, occupied with other stuff during the Cyclopses. Yeah, and sirens, nymphs. <laughs> you you got to watch out for those nymphs. Yeah, they will take a lot of your time. They so will. I, I think he had a dream date on one of the islands. Probably. That, uh, of course, uh, he had his crew turned into pigs and stuff. That sort of distracts yep. you as well. Mm -hmm. You also have well, he had, Aeneas oh, taking the trip. It takes a long time for him as well. How long did it take him? I think, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, he was behind Odysseus for a long part of the trip. So he must have taken years at least. Well, I know, I mean, we know Odysseus had Poseidon against him the whole time. So that was probably part of it as well. That's a bad thing if you're traveling. I'm sure these colonists may, made sure that Poseidon was on their side and that they also made the journey at the optimal time so you could avoid the storms, etc. Yeah. And they must have, I'm sure they consulted the oracle to make sure they knew when to go. And of course, the oracle was always right. So, <laughs> yeah, because if the oracle <laughs> was wrong, the people wouldn't come back. Right, exactly. So what happened so, in Gela when they, uh, how did they govern the city? So like most other colonies, they governed the city like they would govern, well, they would, first you, you're, uh, how do you pronounce it? The Okairos, uh, the leader of the colony. That right? works. Yep. So he is in charge until his death. And then after that, they would decide to run the colony like the mother city. Yes. So that's how they did it. All the Greek colonies were, as you know, were, were different. Some were run one way, some were run another. But, they, you know, this way they planned it. So they followed the Greek social model, but they had their own independent government. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was concentrated into the hands of a few families. 
and then you know then they voted on making it just like the regular the original cities. Yeah. It's still there today, as we said, Gala. It was actually Gala was the first Italian beach reached by the Allies in the invasion of Sicily in 1943. Wow. Mm-hmm. And the population of today seventy five thousand and one. That's very specific. <laughs> Right, the day they did that. We have another one, and we have a new birth today. It was seventy-five thousand and one, and it's nice there too. When when I first researched this was January, and it was minus five uh, Fahrenheit, so that's like minus twenty Celsius. And and January in Gala, it's seventy-two degrees Fahrenheit and twenty-two Celsius. So that's probably another reason why they picked that spot. Yeah, it's uh, when I go to the Mediterranean, I'm always so envious of their climate it's like why did i get born in this cold <laughs> northern country of sweden but nobody has ever successfully invaded sweden and that is probably because nobody else ever wants to go here the only <laughs> other people who's been really interested and tried conquering sweden uh, is the russians because they are the only ones used to this cold temperature Actually, we have been conquered by Denmark, but that's uh, sort of our brothers, so right. it's a sibling struggle. Right, right, right. How cold? What's the temperature there now? It's uh, nine degrees uh, centigrade, which is uh, something in uh, I don't understand in Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. Well, that's probably about. Yeah, it's not that warm. I will. We we have a beautiful spring. It's forty-eight degrees. All right, Fahrenheit. that's not bad. So Not it's so uh, and the the good thing with living this far north is that it becomes extremely bright during the summer. I'm not above the polar circle, so we don't have these 24 hours of daylight, but we get pretty close to that during really? uh, June. Yeah, so it's uh, now the sun sets at about 8 p.m. Wow, that is nice. Okay, so here's the deal when it when it's you could come here when it's winter so you can escape the dark and then I could come there in the summer to see that sometime. No, well, sounds good. All right. Live podcasting. Very that's true. We could do, we could do that. Probably we would do good at it. Yeah. I just uh, did that for another podcast actually. So we tried to we live broadcasted. I I did a lot of live streaming for my Magic the Gathering cha- YouTube channel. Yeah. But uh, I uh, it's complicated to do things live. Was that the one with the fan fiction? Did you guys do that one live? Uh, yes, we did. I thought yes. so. And also, Suetonius was in my actual podcasting studio. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. let's move on from Sicily. Where do you want to go now? I mean, um, we could go to... Um, there's actually another colony. Should we maybe do that one? Oh, we have another colony. I do. I do. I knew that. I knew I had that in there because there was yeah. this other. And this is kind of interesting too. The the cal the cal colony. Sorry, of Chalcedon settlers from Megara created this, and it, it's funny because they it's near Byzantium, right, in Constantinople, which is a great site. And they say whoever decided on this site must have been blind because it's not the best site to be. So. That's what <laughs> Chalcedon means, city of the blind. Wow. Pliny relates that the Oracle of Apollo told the Athenians and Megarians who founded Byzantium in 657 to build their city opposite to the blind and that they interpreted the blind to mean Chalcedon as it was known as the city of the blind. Right. Because <laughs> the site was so bad. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Does it's- this colony survive? Yeah, it's now it's a it's a district in the city of Istanbul. It's called uh, Kadikoy in Turkish. Mm. And um, from Megara to Chalcedon is eleven hundred and thirty nine kilometers. That's quite far. Yeah, and if you but today if you drove it, it's only eleven hours and forty nine minutes. <laughs> you could take the E ninety all the way. Oh. But well, sure. the Greeks couldn't do that. No, I'm sure that they did not. But I would wonder if they they took a, you know, if did they they must have took a boat. I'm sure they they took boats and hugged the coast just like the other colonists did. Probably. Um, I couldn't find any the method that they did, but I'm sure that they would have done done it that way. But it wasn't as long of a journey as the last colony that set up. So maybe because they were blind. 
<laughs> maybe like they held the coast with one hand so they could yeah. feel their way. That's, that could be what they did. So, yeah, but that colony still exists today as well. Um, oh, but also um, it, later it's famous for the uh, Council of, of Chalcedon in 451 AD or CE, we could say, which is oh, a Christian yes. con- con- um, you know, council. It was um, called by Emperor Marcion um, to set aside the second, uh, the, the second council of Ephesus, which had deposed a number of bishops and resulted in the death of Archbishop Flavian of Constantinople. Shortly thereafter, of injuries is sustained in a beating. Not very wow. Christian, Christian-like to uh, beat a bishop to death. You can hear all about this in the podcast History of Byzantium, which I highly recommend. It's this, uh, when, uh, uh, when History of Rome ended, he offered sort of, if somebody else wants to do the History of Byzantium, I will be fully supportive of it. And uh, it happened. One really? guy started the History of Byzantium and he has done, he very much followed in uh, Mike Duncan's style. And he's pretty good too. So he, he relates these events in his podcast. Well, I'm definitely going to have to look that up. History of Byzantium. Yeah. I forgot to mention that in the beginning. I, I also did, I did listen to the um, uh, Mike Duncan's Whole History of Rome podcast, which was very good. Yeah, I, I continue to listen to his uh, new podcast, Revolutions. And it's also very good. He taught me a lot of things I didn't know about the revolutions, particularly of the 19th century. I started that one, um, that one, and I haven't finished it. I, I got, oh, I started doing yours, I think, actually. Oh, oh wow, I beat Mike Duncan. Yeah, Look at I that. did. I did. I, I was doing the, 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 the 19th century ones, like the revolutions of 1848, and then I just, I, I kind of stopped. It's amazing to compare the 680s BC to uh, 451 AD because the questions they are concerned about at the Council of Chalcedon is like so far away from the way we think today and so far away from the way they thought in the 680s BC because these definitions that they they die for it's like what's the nature of God and it's like these really deep religious questions that uh, very few people consider super important today. Yeah, right. And then they would have thought not important back then either. They would have said, yeah, there's 10 gods, 20 gods, 30. What's the problem? And, you know, in, those, in that council, they were saying, there's one god who's three people. And that's how it works. Yeah, the, the um, issue of the, uh, the, the Chalcedonian, Chalcedonian definition uh, that they finally came upon in this council was that Jesus is perfect both in deity and in humanness. This save self one is also actually God and actually man, which meant that uh, you would now burn as a heretic if you thought that Jesus was only a God, and you would burn as a heretic if you thought that Jesus was a human. Well, I would be in trouble today, I have to say. That's all I'll say about that. Where do you want to go next? Well, now we can go to um, Gyges. You know about Gyges? Oh, is this about uh, Conan? No, no. <laughs> and the know. Cimmerians? <laughs> no, t- I don't know. There, was there a Gyges and Conan the Barbarian? Uh, no, oh. I don't think so. Oh. Maybe there was. Oh. Howard was kind of interested in having uh, historical names and stuff. Oh, well, this guy just character, he's really cool. I mean, you know, you think like, oh, the 680s, what are we gonna find? What am I going to find on that? And then you come up with this guy just is, I mean, this is just so cool. So guy just, um, and this was cool too. This is sort of an off, a little bit out of tangent, but the, the, the first time the word tyrant is used in Greek um, is referring to guy just, and it's this poet. What? Yeah, I mean, I just found this yesterday when I was, uh, you know, polishing stuff up for this, or maybe a couple days ago. So there's this poet, Archilochus. Archilochus is his name. And they have a lot of his poetry, and it's it's quite bawdy, actually, because when I went to look up this one little part, um, 
it, it's like, whoa, he's, so we can't talk about that here. But So his name is Archilochus, and he was born in 680, so that's appropriate. So anyway, here's this part, it was a short poem where he says, The affairs of gold-laden Gyges do not interest me. Jealousy of the gods has never seized me, nor anger at their deeds. But I have no love for great tyranny, for its deeds are very far from my eyes. And that's the first time the word tyrant is found in Greek. That's a very Gyges. questionable honor for Gyges to be the first tyrant yes. in history. How about that? Yeah, so, the first one labeled tyrant by anyone. I mean, the, the, um, so again, not to get too far on a tangent, I guess the word tyrant, the way we use it is a little different. Tyrant is more like, not, it's sort of like a king. It doesn't necessarily mean you rule as like a terrible tyrant. It's more like you're sort of the illegitimate ruler you sort of you're not like a the god given king you know you're not born as the king you sort of take over power in a different way and then but you there's no democracy either so you're in charge but you're not a king sort of it's that's, sort of like uh, the way we use dictator today exactly the Romans, which also had a very different origin exactly that's exactly correct oh But so, do you know the story of the? There's three different stories of Gyges. The one really tell me. So okay, so the the cool story from Herodotus. I'm going to try to sum this up and tell the story as best I can without just reading it. Does that sound all right? Okay. Or do you think I should read Her- Herodotus's uh, story? I think uh, the Herodotus copyright has run out, so we can read it. <laughs> all right, let's read his story because it is very. It's pretty cool. All right. So. Yep. So, there's a king, Candules is his name. Candules became passionately in love with his wife, so madly in love that he thought she was by far the most beautiful of all women. His obsession with her beauty had disastrous consequences, for indeed it was inevitable that Candules suffer a bad fate. Now, This is can, something we found we find in a lot of ancient sources that it's a really bad thing to actually be in love with your wife. Marriage is an institution for solving uh, her, uh, heritage problems that who who gets what, and if you become passionate in love with your wife, then you're doing something wrong. Wow, interesting. That's you will see it very clearly among the Romans that. Pompey the Great, for example, was taunted for the fact that he actually loved his wife. And 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 I, and even Dante's, I believe, has a level of hell for lovers. Right? If you love each other too much instead of God, then you have a certain level of hell. Yeah, be careful with that thing called love. It's dangerous. Yes, as we know. Please continue. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so, Can- so Candulus had in his bodyguard a man, Argyges, with whom he was especially pleased. And to this Gyges, he entrusted very important duties and besides revealed to him his passionate adoration of his wife's beauty. For some time, over and over again, Candules regaled Gyges with his excessive praise until one day he suggested that Gyges must confirm for himself the truth of his boasts. So now this is sort of like, reads like a play. Okay, do you want me to do Gan- Candoles? Yeah, Can- that'll be good. It seems to me, Gyges, that you are not convinced by what I say about the loveliness of my wife, since it is the case that what one sees with one's own eyes is much more convincing than what one merely hears with one's own ears. Find some way to behold my wife naked. (gasps) Oh, my king, what are you saying? How unseemly to order me to behold my mistress naked. When a woman takes off her clothes, at the very same time, she strips herself completely of all her modesty. Long ago, the rules of proper behavior were established for our society, and we must follow them. Cardinal is the one ordaining that each of us should look upon his own. You have convinced me that your wife is the most beautiful of all women. I beg you, do not ask me to do what is wrong. Have courage, Gyges. Do not be afraid of me. I am not attempting to put you to the test by what I propose. And do not fear my wife, because you think that she will cause you some harm. From the outset, I shall find a way by which my wife will not even know that she has been seen by you. I shall place you in the room where we sleep, behind the open door. After I enter, 
to go to bed, my wife will follow. Near the entrance, there is a chair. On it, she will lay her clothes as she takes them off, each garment, one by one. And so, you will have plenty of time to have a good look at her naked. When she moves from the chair to the bed and you are facing her back, then be very careful that she does not see you as you leave through the doorway. So now Guy just, uh, he had no choice. He had to do what he was told. So, Candulus led Guy just to the bedchamber. When he thought it was time for bed, and very soon afterward, his wife followed. Guy just watched her as she came in and took off her clothes. But when she came, when she went back from the chair to the bed and her back was toward him, he stealthily slipped out. But the woman saw him as he left. Had Guy just dallied a moment too long, mesmerized by the beauty that he had beheld? Realizing what her husband had done, the queen did not cry out because she had been disgraced, nor did she even let on that she knew, because it was her intention to exact revenge upon this Candules, her husband. Indeed, among the Lydians and almost all the other non-Greeks, even for a man to be seen naked brings great shame. And so at the time of the outrage, she revealed nothing and kept quiet. As soon as day broke, however, the queen made ready with daggers those among her retinue, whom she knew to be the most trustworthy, and then summoned Gyges. He came to her bidding, not suspecting that he knew about what had happened the night before. He was accustomed on previous occasions to visit the queen whenever she called. When Gyges arrived, she spoke bluntly. Okay, now I'm the queen. Okay. Now, Gyges, there are two courses open to you, and I give you a choice, whichever one you want. Either kill Candaules and take both me and the kingdom of the Lydians, or... Die at once, right here, by the daggers of my attendants, as you must. In the future, you will never again look upon what you should not in obedience to Candaules' command. Either my husband must be killed, since he devised the whole sordid scheme, or you, the one who saw me naked, defied our moors and committed this offense. Gyges at first was amazed at her words and stunned just as he had been transfixed by her beauty. Now, as never before, he was overwhelmed and dismayed by her intelligence, strength, and inflexible determination. When he was able to speak, he pleaded with the king not to force him to have to make such a horrendous choice. He could not persuade her, and now realized in horror that necessity lay (laughs) irrevocably upon him. Irrevocably upon him. Either he must kill his master or be killed by the queen's attendants. He chose that he himself should live. Gyges, since you compel me to kill my master and my king against my will, please let me hear in what way we shall attack him. The attack will be on the very spot where he showed me naked to you, a perfect retribution for what he has done, and let him be killed while he is sleeping. They made their preparation for the murder, and at nightfall, Gyges followed Candule's wife into the bedchamber. There was no way Gyges could be released from the choice, no possible escape. Either he must die or Candule's. The queen gave a dagger to Gyges and hid him behind the same door where he had spied on her. While Candule's was asleep, Gyges stole up from behind the door and killed him with the dagger. And now Gyges possessed both the wife and the kingdom. That's pretty convenient. Yeah, that this reeks of Herodotus. Right? <laughs> this is, they say Herodotus seeks explanations for transfers of political power, and he will give you good stories. That, that's definitely a good one. Yep. Um, there was, um, I, there's one little interesting thing I found with, with the, back with the Assyrians. They, they have a little diplomatic story here, and he says, um, it was from Assurbanipal, actually. So it's, it says, Gyges rider set out. He reached the border of my company. My men spotted him and asked him, Who are you, stranger, you, whose country's rider never traveled the road to the frontier? They brought him to Nineveh, my royal city, into my presence. But of all the languages of east and west, 
over which the god Asher has given me control, there was no interpreter of his tongue. His language was so foreign that none of his words were understood. So that's kind of interesting. I thought that they referenced the territory there, but they couldn't even understand what language he was speaking. Lydia is separated from Assyria by high mountains, but it's rather close to the Assyrian border. Right. So um, somewhere I, I noticed it said, I, I found that guy just could be a rendering of the Luv- Luvian word hoo-ha, <laughs> um, which means grandfather, but it also looks like a title. So it's hard. I mean, I would have think the Assyrians wouldn't be familiar with Luvian at this time. But anyway, that's another – that's that's the main story of Guy just is, is him with his, um, um, you know, how he takes power by he has to see his king's wife naked and then the king's wife asks him to kill the king. Oh, that's, a, that's a good story. Uh, I also saw, found that Pliny the Elder said that Guy just invented all ball games. Of course he did. <laughs> I mean, that's quite an accomplishment, right? I mean, basketball, baseball, soccer, football. That's Name typical it. Roman explanations. They mm-hmm. they want an explanation, so they invent one. Mm-hmm. It's like the early Roman kings. They become sort of pegs on which you hang everything. That uh, Wait, we have sewers. Oh, it was probably this guy. Right. Wait, we have this religion. Well, probably the religious king. Mm-hmm. That's right. We Actually, have more on Gyges. Yeah, there's more. I mean, there's... Um, now, Plato has a story on the Ring of Gyges, which is... It's definitely just an allegory, just a story, because basically the Ring of Gyges is sort of like um, um, the Lord of the Rings ring, where you put the ring on, you become invisible. Okay, tell me that story. Let me read. I could read that this one, too. Here's Plato's story about the Ring of Gyges. So Gyges was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia. There was a great storm, and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at the sight, he descended into the opening, where, among other marvels, he beheld a hollow, braven horse having doors, at which he, stooping and looking in, saw a dead body of stature, as appeared to him, more than human. And having nothing on but a gold ring, he took this from the finger of the dead and reascended. Now, the shepherds met together according to custom that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king. Into their assembly he came, having the ring on his finger, and as he was sitting among them, he chanced to turn to collect of the ring inside his hand, when he instantly became invisible to the rest of the company, and they began to speak of him as if he were no longer present. He was astonished at this, and again, touching the ring, he turned the collet outwards and reappeared. He made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible. When outwards, he reappeared. Whereupon, he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, where as soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen, and with her help, conspired against the king and slew him and took the kingdom." So that's the story. Um, wow, it's uh, it sort of skipped over a part there where like he appears uh, from invisibility before the queen and but oh look, I'm a great wizard. <laughs> Do you want a kiss? <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked, okay, uh, and then uh, wait, I have a husband. Oh, let's kill him. I can be your husband. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a plan, right? I mean, they do make the women kind of like um, simple in these stories, aren't they? I think the the first uh, version queen was more complicated. Yes, for sure. I mean, this is just a story that Plato tells about saying, you know, if you have such a ring, how could you stay? How could you be? You wouldn't be virtuous. You know, you're eventually going to, you know, descend into doing bad things, which is kind of the story of the Lord Lord of the Rings, right? Because every time he puts the ring on, it sort of makes him more crazy. And, you know, he has to be careful how many times he turns himself invisible. Is this the first inspiration for Lord of the Rings? I wouldn't be surprised, would you? No, <laughs> Tolkien was uh, an educated man. Yeah, I mean, most of the, the stories, like we said before, the Game of Thrones, I mean, these stories all really come from history. History's got, I mean, really, I think history has better stories than you can make up, for sure. For sure, and we have more stories about judges. Yeah, there's more stories. It's probably more the real one. Okay. Um, let's see here. So 
Let's see. So this comes from Nicholas of Damascus. Um, when we first meet Gyges, um, he's a handsome eighteen-year-old. He's you know good-looking, and he's re- been recalled to Lydia by a childless uncle and adopted by him. So his um, outstanding qualities soon bring him to the attention of the king, and he is appointed to the royal bodyguard. The king eventually comes to see the boy as a rival and attempts to have him killed by setting him in a series of dangerous tasks, which, each of which Guy just accomplishes with ease. So won over by Guy just as prow- prowess, he is uh, richly rewarded and he's, and he's elevated into a high position of the court. Soon thereafter, the king decides to marry, and Gyges is sent to fetch the bride. And overwhelmed with desire, he attempts to seduce the girl who rejects his advance, advances altogether. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll read this part. When, he reached the king, when she reached the king, she told him everything Gyges had done and that he had wished to have intercourse with her. Enraged, the king swore that he would kill Gyges on the following day. A slave girl who happened to be in the bedroom and is madly in love with Gyges, so everybody really likes Gyges here, she immediately reports the whole matter to him. While it was still night, Gyges went running about to share the news with his friends and demand that they help him in a plot to kill the king. He reminded them, in addition, the curse of Artis and how the king had invoked destruction on the murderers of Adasilus. This curse is like a whole other story that's way backstory. Um... So anyway, so thinking of better under the circumstances to kill the king rather than be killed himself by him, he outfitted the most trusted of his friends and made an assault against the king with his sword, the slave girl having opened the doors of the bedroom for him. Gyges entered the chamber and killed the king in his sleep after the king had reigned for only three years. So what happened to the queen? Uh, there wasn't a queen because that was the one... This one, there isn't a queen. He was supposed to marry the queen, but he liked the queen, the to-be queen. So maybe so, he took her. Or, or the slave girl. Yeah, Seems maybe. that the slave girl was more into him. Yeah, it could be that. I mean, that's a Game of Thrones story right there, wouldn't it be? I, thought, I was about to say that. It, it was the most Game of Thrones-like story so far. Right? And this, there's all other stuff about Guy just in this area. They, 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 someone said that, um, you know, Gog and Magog? Well, some... Yeah. They say that maybe Guy just was Gog. Ooh. <laughs> but that, that's the Gog and Magog story really gets more into um, later Christian literature and stuff like that. Where Gog and Magog, I think, are really the horse, the horse uh, nomads of the steppes that come in and just, you know, ravage everybody. And they are in the Book of Revelation and in the Quran. Yes. The, the, the menacing hordes. Huns, Scythians, Sumerians, Mongols. Yeah, and I have a hard time imagining the Lydians being the menacing hordes. Yeah, no. They're not that powerful. Mm -mm. But they were in the area, I think, at the time when none of that was written, so I think the menacing hordes may actually have taken over them, is why. Yeah, those those Sumerians. Right. The Sumerians, they're kind of like in between the menacing hordes. You know, they're sort of like... Maybe like the Goths and the Huns. You know how the Goths were on the borders yes. of the Roman Empire, but the Huns were worse. I actually wrote a novel about Alaric and the, the Western Goths. Really? Yes, it's not published. Well, I'll, I'll but check I, I know I know too much about the years 395 to 410 AD. You mean you know too much about it? Yeah, it became a problem. I couldn't write a good story. I was just, I have to get in all this real information. So. Yeah. The story is actually pretty bad. Ah, I'd be the judge of that. Maybe let me read it someday. It's in Swedish. <laughs> ah, I should have thought of that. Well, that's a problem. Okay, do we? Uh, that was the Ly- Lydians and yeah. uh, Gyges. Yeah. Where can we go? Well, sorry, you're just gonna have to wait till next time on the next episode of Fan of History. See you next time. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash fanofhistory. Just a dollar an episode would help us out. Thanks, and see you next time.